here today. Okay, recording progress, got it. Um, she is now an associate faculty member in the New York Genome Center, uh, where she started the lab a few years ago. And she also is, has been recently, well, and she's a professor at the KPH Royal Institute of Technology, and she has been recently appointed director of the National Genomics Infrastructure and Genomics Platform at the Sidelife Lab in Sweden. So she's running a lab in Stockholm and a lab in New York. Um, and her, uh, her research focuses on genetic variation or trying to understand genetic variation in human populations with the aim to discover how genetic differences among people contribute to differences in traits and disease risk. And the ultimate goal, of course, is to try to map the cellular mechanisms that mediate these associations. Um, she's been an extremely uh, successful researcher. I mean, has, you know, uh, 22,000 citations, 71 publications, according to Google Scholar, and, and, and a meteoric career, in my opinion. So I'm really looking forward to hear your talk today, truly. And um, it's going to be, she's going to be talking about functional variation in the human genome, lessons from the transcriptome. So yeah, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Marta, for, for the introduction and for, for having me here. It's um, um, always a pleasure to, to visit Barcelona, even if remotely. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, collaborate with fun. you. <laughs> Many people from your community, including Marta, back in back in the day. So, so it's it's really a pleasure, and I appreciate you saying that I started my lab in New York a few years ago, but it has actually been many many years now. <laughs> <It's> 14 <laughs> when I, when I started, <laughs> time goes very fast. All and, right. Yeah, and as Marta said, since then I have partially relocated to to Sweden, so I'm primarily based in Stockholm nowadays. Uh, but also I'm right now in New York, and and I have a lab on, on two continents. So, so uh, let's just dive straight in. So I'll start with a little bit of an introduction to kind of the general framework of a functional interpretation of genetic variation, why we do this and how we do this. And then, and then I'll describe a couple of, a couple of recent studies uh, from, from my lab. So, so um, as you all know, during the past 15 years or so, the human genetics community has been extremely successful in creating these massive catalogs of genetic variants that associate to human traits and diseases, including rare variants, common variants for complex diseases, et cetera, et cetera. We have very comprehensive maps of how genetic variation affects uh, human traits. Uh, the problem with these catalogs is though that um, on their own, they don't really tell us super much about what are the biological and molecular cellular mechanisms that mediate these associations between teeny tiny genetic perturbations and very complex human traits and diseases. And one of the ways to bridge this gap is to link genetic variants to changes uh, in molecular phenotypes, such as the transcriptome gene expression and other traits of the transcriptome that my lab has been focusing on to kind of uh, build this, uh, build this um, um, sort of understanding of what are the biological processes that mediate genetic effects on traits. Um, so uh, mapping, uh, doing sort of large scale genome wide analysis of how genetic variants affect gene expression uh, provides us insights into mechanisms of rare disease associations and particularly GWAS loci for common uh, complex traits and diseases where uh, about 90% of these associations are in the non-coding uh, space of the genome and, and it was a bit of an unpleasant surprise when GWAS started to come out and people realized that the biological interpretation of these associations is really going to be quite a challenge. There is also potential in, in kind of genome and transcriptome integration to improve genetic diagnosis. I'm not sure I'm going to really talk about much, uh, uh, not going to talk much about that today, but, but we've done some work in that area as well. And one of the things that we have always been in, interested in is not just this kind of like sort of um, disease locus interpretation, but understanding the general functional genetic architecture of human traits, what types of genetic variants with what types of molecular effects uh, actually underlie intra-individual variation in genome function. And one of the final things that I want to just kind of mention here quickly is that um, the transcriptome and other molecular phenotypes of the cell provide a potential readout of not just genetic effects, um, but also environmental effects that are a major contributor of, of uh, traits and diseases. And, and, and there is some potential there to kind of integrate the insights uh, uh, from, from both. And this, this uh, field of 
um, I guess one could call it functional population genetics or something along those lines, is really kind of at the intersection of, of two classically quite distinct areas of biology where there is sort of population genetics, quantitative genetics, uh, community focusing on genetic variation. And then there is the molecular genomics community thinking about genome function. And so kind of communities like ENCODE would belong in the, in the blue space here. And we are in the middle taking a lot of the statistical approaches from the, from the population and quantitative genetics uh, side from the GWAS community and our interest in function and molecular assays from the, from the molecular genomics side and, and then put these things together. So, so just um, the only mention that I think uh, that I will have here about um, rare disease uh, patients, um, sort of Mendelian disease patients and rare variants that, that contribute to that. Um, this is a space where that is kind of like in some ways the lower lower hanging fruit when it comes to um, molecular medicine and using using sort of um, molecular readouts to enhance uh, human health. And here a transcriptome analysis is already proving useful. Um, us and others have done work to, to basically um, use RNA sequencing data to better identify variants and genes where an individual carries uh, sort of like, like a severely um, a, a variant that, that severely affects gene, gene function. And this, this has been shown to improve uh, diagnosis uh, rates. And we discussed this a little bit more in, in a recent uh, review that we wrote with uh, Dan MacArthur. But when it comes to complex disease genetics and interpretation of Chiwas loci, the situation is uh, unsurprisingly more complex. They really kind of deserve their name for multiple different reasons. So first of all, of course, one can use, or, or I mean, Chiwases are being used to identify associated loci, so genetic positions that associate to a given uh, disease or a trait of interest. But then what, what we can kind of like dive into individual loci and ask, okay, so what are the likely causal variants in a, in a given locus? Because um, linkage disequilibrium, correlation of nearby variants, uh, we typically see these kinds of peaks where there are multiple associated variants and, and typically one or sometimes it could be several of them are actually the ones that uh, sort of functionally perturb something in the genome that then, then leads to molecular changes and ultimately the, the uh, GWAS association. So identifying those causal variants is, uh, is a challenge on its own. Then the, another kind of complementary or, or kind of a, a parallel question at the same time is to ask that, okay, so you have this uh, GWAS logos, you have some SNPs there, maybe you have a better guess that one of them might be the causal variant here marked in blue, but so, so how do they affect genome function? Are they in an enhancer? Do they affect the binding of a transcription factor or something? And then probably the most important question of, of all of these is, what are the target genes in the locus that actually causally mediate disease association? So, so often these variants sit in, in kind of large interns or intragenic space, non-coding regions, and it is really not, not always obvious what is the gene whose uh, expression or regulation they are somehow affecting. And, and there are a couple of different different ways to to analyze these these things, and I'll, I'll talk about them uh, later later today. And then, of course, there is the question of what are the affected pathways that, if you think about all of these GWAS loci, and 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 sort of. Uh, um, how these changes in the cis regulatory locus, like in, in, in that particular genome, genome position, um, how that then ultimately somehow translates to, to uh, changes in biological pathways, regulatory networks, et cetera, is also a challenge that then often requires integration of data across multiple uh, GWAS loci. And then for all of these, these um, questions, um, there is the important question of what is the relevant cell type or cell state where these causal disease processes are taking space. So this is really a large, um, big set of questions. Uh, luckily, we have also multiple different approaches to try to address these questions. I'm not going to go through this table in, in detail, but just to kind of like highlight that there is sort of, we can do different types of analysis ranging from, from analysis of sort of GWAS, GWAS summary stats, integration with functional annotations, for example, from ENCODE. Um, most of the work that my lab has been doing is in the space of population scale molecular assays, where we um, basically integrate genome and transcriptome data from a large number of individuals. Um, and I'll talk talk more about that. Uh, we do some, some kind of other areas of work as well. And, and now we are increasingly also, uh, just like everyone in the field, uh, getting into the space of using experimental perturbations 
uh, of the genome or its function to, to probe at, at GWAS loci or other loci and, and thus characterize their, their molecular effects. But so to get to the, the kind of the, the blue part here, so large scale integration of genome and transcriptome data. I've been fortunate to be part of uh, many um, uh, huge consortium projects that have been creating these large data sets um, for, for the entire community to use and, and, and for, this, for this consortia to ask um, uh, various different, different questions. The most important um, project for me of, of these has, has been the Genotype Tissue Expression Project, or GTEx, which is uh, the largest um, um, existing effort to map genetic regulatory variants across multiple different human tissues. And here in the, in the, um, the final GTEx um, um, paper, so now the consortium is sort of like wrapping, wrapping up in a, in a way, um, and we published the, the, the final set of papers uh, last year. Um, we had over 17,000 tissue samples from over 50 tissues of over 800 donors, and then RNA sequencing data from all the tissue samples, genome sequencing data from the individuals, and this allowed us to map in all of these different tissues uh, genetic associations for gene expression and splicing. So this is what we call eQTL and splicing QTL mapping, where the principle is that like here's an example where um, the genotype of a given SNP, each individual here is an, is an individual, the, their genotype is associated with expression level of a nearby gene. And this type of analysis can be done uh, for basically all genes expressed in a, in a given tissue. And, and this has allowed us to map really uh, thousands and thousands of genes per tissue um, that have genetic regulatory variants affecting either expression or, or splicing. So, so this is this is great. Um, the GTEx uh, sort of work is, is published now, so I'm not going to really uh, talk about that in detail. But I just want to summarize some of the kind of lessons lessons learned and key key takeaways. So, first of all, regulatory variation is extremely widespread. This is what we know from multiple studies thus far that basically all human genes, almost all human genes, are affected by common genetic variation that affects their expression or splicing or other other traits of their kind of trans transcription or post-transcription or regulation. Uh, quite a lot of these, these, these variant effects are actually shared between tissues, um, which was maybe a bit of a surprise, but we have now also seen, seen with in silico cell type composition analysis that a lot of, a lot of this sharing that we see between GTX tissues is due to sharing of cell types between different tissues and really kind of highlighting the importance of getting that cell type resolution. We can, we can, even when we have just bulk tissue data with cell type deconvolution, we can sort of extract cell type interaction QTLs that, that provide us um, with kind of like a way to look into, into genetic regulatory variants with cell type specific uh, effects, even when we don't have single cell data. And we have done this at, at scale. And then when it comes to um, interpretation of GWAS associated loci, uh, this is maybe something where it's a bit of like a glass half full. So there were maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago in the community, a lot of hopes that if we just kind of like do studies like GTEx and just kind of like map all these EQTLs, this is going to solve all of our problems when it comes to GWAS interpretation. But it's, I don't, I, I think this was potentially a naive way to think about it when it comes to functional effects of genetic variants. It's a hugely complex question where no approach, at least not thus far, has proven to be like the silver bullet and, and neither is QTL mapping. But so, so there's still a lot of, lot of work to be done, but also a lot of interesting and useful insights of, of loci where QTLs kind of pinpoint specific hypotheses. And also we get sort of interesting insights into the functional architecture of GWAS loci. For example, we can see sort of convergence of GWAS effects when you have a gene that is that kind of has a GWAS signal uh, that can come from uh, independent EQTLs and splicing QTLs and rare variants affecting the same gene. So kind of like various different kind of transcriptional perturbations of, of the same gene are having, some con having concordant uh, GWAS effects. And we can see also that GWAS pleiotropy, so basically the same variant affecting multiple uh, diseases and traits, um, partially stems from gene regulatory pleiotropy, where this, uh, a given variant affects the expression of multiple C genes in uh, cis. But um, to kind of uh, look a little bit forward and ask, what are we pursuing next? 
now that we're in a situation where with, with uh, GTX and, and some other efforts, uh, the CIS EQTL and splicing QTL catalog across human tissues in Europeans is essentially complete. This doesn't mean that we are done, though. Uh, I mean, so GTX doesn't have every single tissue, but but we the, the tissue collection is really quite comprehensive, and the sharing patterns are so so broad that that we can still kind of consider this to be a reasonably reasonably complete effort. But some of the bigger gaps that we are, us and others are working on right now is, as I already uh, mentioned, that the tissue resolution is really not sufficient. So GTX was started way, well before um, single cell technology even existed and allowed to uh, characterize uh, cell type specific effects and more sort of dynamic uh, effects in, in, in different cell states. But, but this is an essential component that, that the community is now addressing. Um, the kind of mapping that we have done thus far, even though GTX is, is huge, and there are other studies as well, we know that these, these studies are still underpowered for quite a lot of analysis when we want to do kind of a little bit more complicated things than, than the sort of vanilla cis QTL mapping for genetic variants and their nearby genes. Um, there is, there is, uh, uh, we are working on some interesting approaches to be able to increase the sample sizes of, of these studies uh, dramatically. Um, analysis of transcriptome traits and expression and, and splicing as we are able to quantify these from, from Illumina short reads is, is, is interesting and it's, it's the kind of the, the most scalable uh, molecular phenotype, but there are also other molecular phenotypes that are very in, informative, including, for example, attack seek date and protein quantifications. Um, et cetera. Uh, GTX is, um, it, it is an American sample that is mostly European ancestry individuals. And um, it is very important that as, as GWA studies are slowly but surely um, becoming better at, at incorporating and including non-European ancestries as, as well, that we also create the data sets for functional interpretation of these associations. And uh, then finally, this type of QTL mapping, basically association mapping where we leverage existing variation in the human population. It is, it is one approach to map genetic uh, regulatory effects and characterize um, functional effects of variants. But as I, as I mentioned earlier, these kinds of experimental perturbation approaches are also kind of like the new kid on the block when it comes to, comes to these, these approaches. The QTL approach used to be the only scalable sort of a truly genome-wide way to do this analysis, but that is no longer the case. So what I'm going to do next is, is basically um, start, first uh, describe a recent study in my lab where we have kind of taken the other molecular phenotypes into, into the uh, more detailed, better transcriptome uh, space. And this is because short read um, RNA sequencing data has limitations. So I've been analyzing these data for, I don't know, 12 years now. And it's, it's like, yeah, I love Illumina RNA seq data. It has served the community very well. But the, the reality is that the biological units and functional molecules of the transcriptome are transcripts and not genes. And um, when we have a short read data that, that we basically yeah, that's just kind of it's 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 choppy. It's teeny tiny pieces of of this um, um, transcript uh, molecules. This this leads to inaccuracy when it comes to transcript annotation, uh, detection, and quantification. Even though there are pretty good algorithms for doing these things, it's that they are not perfect, and and the data the short read data simply doesn't carry all the information that you need for a really really uh, kind of detailed and accurate uh, transcript uh, description. There is also a poor resolution into the specific types of transcript changes. So GTX, for example, analyzed uh, splicing patterns and mapped splicing QTLs using the leaf cutter algorithm that, that basically kind of detects if something changes in the intron exon structure of a given gene. And, and it is quite powerful because it's sort of like able to extract kind of quite detailed data from, from the, from the uh, reads. But it does not provide us with the kind of like um, information such as, okay, so here we have an 18 base pair extension of exon 3 into intron 4, or here we have a 20% decrease in the usage of a given exon. We don't get that kind of like biological interpretability of the transcript changes from short read data quite often. 
And then finally, we also, uh, the short reads uh, don't allow us to study allele specific transcript structure, which I'll describe in a moment. So this is why we embarked on a long read RNA sequencing study of a large number of Chichex uh, tissue samples. So this, uh, this project has been a collaboration with uh, the Prode Institute and also Oxford Nanopore Technology and led by Daphne Klinos, who, who was a poster uh, in my lab. So what we had in this study was 88 samples uh, from, from GTX uh, donors with RNA sequencing data using primarily the cDNA PCR protocol from, from Oxford Nanopore. So we're not uh, sequencing directly RNA, but, but cDNA with long reads. And this, this comprises of 40 trait donors across 15 different tissues. And, and from GTX, we of course have genome sequencing data and Illumina rna seq data from these, from these individuals. And we also, for the fibroblast uh, cells, we did also like a knockdown of a, of a, um, a, a splicing factor to, to characterize how we see those kinds of changes in splicing in, in long reach. And a relatively standard pipeline for um, long read transcriptome analysis. If there are any kind of transcriptome tool developers there, there is a lot of work that is needed in this space to, to make these pipelines better, more accurate, uh, more scalable. So, so what we have, our data set here is probably the largest um, cDNA or, or transcriptome long read um, analysis with ONT, and it was really difficult. It took us months to be able to, to run these, these uh, pipelines and just kind of push our data through. And we can see in the data that, I mean, well, I'm very grateful for, for these tools. It is much better than, than nothing, and we would have been really in, in, in trouble if we had had to start from writing alignment algorithms or isoform quantification algorithms from the scratch. But especially in the isoform quantification in the flare pipeline, that is quite good we still kind of see that it quite often just gets things wrong. So there is there's important improvements that are needed here. But in any case, um, we were able to analyze this data and detect quite a, quite a bit of interesting things. So the first thing that kind of popped out of, of the analysis of transcripts, including novel transcript annotation that we did with quite stringent uh, parameters, is that we detected about 100,000 novel transcripts, which is a substantial addition to the human transcriptome um, annotation. And they, I mean, when we first kind of like saw these numbers, I was a little bit kind of suspicious that you always kind of detect something and maybe this is just some sort of technical garbage. But what we can see is that the novel transcripts actually provide us with better separation of, of the different tissues and tissue types, for example, brain sub, subgroups, et cetera, which tells us that it, they really kind of carry real biological information and, 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 and uh, provide us with, with uh, uh, ability to see, see novel uh, things. The novel transcripts tend to be a little bit more tissue specific than previously annotated transcripts. And what was exciting um, was that the protein validation rates of the novel transcripts are, are quite similar to annotated transcripts, which is really telling us that this is, these are good, good quality novel transcripts that we are finding, finding here. And this was a collaboration with uh, Mike Snyder's lab who, who has created um, uh, protein mass spec data from, from a subset of GTX samples. But what we were mostly interested in being a genetics lab is, is the um, analysis of genetic uh, effects on, on um, the transcriptome using these long read data. And here, because our sample size is too small to do um, uh, QTL mapping, we turn to allele specific um, approaches. And the way these analyses work is first, if we think about allele specific expression that, that us and others have been analyzing a lot, this, this you can do also with short reads. Where, and the idea is that you take an individual where you know from, from genetic, from like whole genome sequencing or other data, that the individual is heterozygous for some variant um, within a gene. And then you can basically go to your um, RNA sequencing reads and, and simply count how often do you see each of the two alleles and observe if there is an imbalance between the two haplotypes. And so if, if you basically have this difference, difference between the two haplotypes in the transcripts, this is almost always a result of a genetic variant that is basically driving differential regulation of the two haplotypes of an, of an individual. Uh, so, so for a uh, little specific expression, this 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 works quite nicely with, with uh, short reads. But when it comes to a little specific transcript structure, this can only be analyzed properly from long reads, and that is because the short reads, like if when you kind of like go to those reads that like overlap the TC variant, for example, the these reads just don't really carry enough information to tell you if there is some change in the structure of the transcripts um, a little bit further away in the in the gene. 
so uh, with long reads, you can actually uh, see these patterns quite quite clearly. So this is what we wanted to analyze to kind of complement the QTL mapping and then also look into more uh, specific analysis. But first, to be able to do that, we uh, had to develop a software tool to be able to analyze uh, these, these um, uh, patterns because there isn't, there isn't anything to do this analysis really at scale from, um, uh, from long reads. So the basic idea here is that every read is assigned to a transcript by the, the transcript quantification pipeline Flare, and then our tool Laurels assigns the annotated reads to haplotypes based on the allele at a heterozygous site. So a pretty, pretty simple. Um, uh, principle, but we need to account for sequencing errors and local allelic alignment biases and some specific properties of the of the long read data. And this gives us basically for each gene uh, in each individual um, kind of like a, a, a a, a table where you have for the, for the two haplotypes uh, counts of reads uh, for the for the different uh, transcripts, and then then we can test if there is basically a difference in the ratios of these uh, transcripts. And we can of course also analyze allele specific expression, basically just looking at the sum, uh, how many uh, reads do we have uh, from from each of the two haplotypes. And this is this is uh, sort of a continuation to a lot of the short read allele specific expression tools that my lab has developed before. But so what is exciting about long reads and doing these types of analysis with ONT data is that it provides insights into uh, the genetic effects into different types of transcript changes. So when we have these allelic imbalances in expression or structure, it is really kind of, we have shown that this is, this is mostly driven by genetic uh, regulatory variants that are heterozygous in the individual. And so we can we can classify these these transcript changes into different types of uh, events from skipped exons to alternative three prime UTRs, alternative five prime splice sites of given exons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we can see that like sometimes these like different types of changes are kind of like uh, um, joined together, so happening at the same time in a in a in the in the same same gene, for example, skipped exons and and alternative uh, first exons tend to co-occur. Um, and it, one thing that is exciting is that we can also see how how allele specific expression and and different uh, and an allele specific transcript structure co co-occur. And this is basically telling us about genetic variants that that may affect both expression or transcript structure either independently or or jointly. And we can see that quite often, like. If we look at the purple bars here. So this is showing like of all allele specific expression um, effect, uh, events, how many also, or what's the proportion that also shows allele specific transcript structure. And a minority of them do, only 25% of them, them do. So there's quite a lot of sort of effects on, on uh, genetic effects on expression that is that has nothing to do with changes in transcript structure versus uh, of the changes in transcript structure shown in, in green, uh, about half of them also show uh, effects on, on gene expression. And in particular, uh, changes in the transcript structure at the five prime end also uh, often, quite often, lead to effects on, on total expression. And, and this is this kind of makes sense because this is where the promoter is. And you could imagine that sort of uh, the differences there could, could quite easily easily um, um, lead to uh, um, lead to changes in total expression levels but but this is in in our understanding the first time that we're really able to see this uh, with with real um, data looking specifically into genetic effects on on gene expression and transfer structure so to kind of summarize the, there's uh, plenty of more more of these these uh, data in the in the paper, I'm sorry, I forgot to put the preprint uh, info here, but this is out in BioArchive. So this is the largest human long read cDNA uh, sequencing data set to date. It's available, it should be now in the GDX portal as of like maybe last week, and the reads are available in Anvil, and, and there is more data that is going to come out when the paper is, is, is fully published. Uh, we found tens of thousands, about 100,000 novel transcripts that, that seem to be of good quality. Uh, carry biological information. The Laurel's pipeline allows us to do alle allelic analysis of, of long reads, and then that helps us to resolve the relationship of, of genetic effects on expression, splicing UTR changes, and etc. Et and it really gives us this kind of additional re resolution into genetic effects on, on uh, transcript structure. And one thing that I didn't talk about is that it, it also allows us to do better variant interpretation.
So um, now I'm going to switch gears and jump to the experimental approaches that I've alluded to a couple of times, how we can think about sort of um, using transcriptome data, not just from human populations, but actually from experimental models to interrogate uh, functional effects of genetic variants. And, and in, in this case, specifically functional effects of genetic variants um, implicated by GWAS. So this is uh, a project uh, led by John Morris, who's a joint postdoc in, in my lab and Neville's and China's lab here at the New York Genome Center. And in, in this uh, study, we basically wanted to kind of combine a couple of the sort of different tools and approaches that have been around um, into, into um, a joint approach that we call SingSeq to characterize uh, gene expression effects of GWAS loci by experimental perturbations. And the way Stingsig works is that uh, you first kind of start from your in silico analysis of uh, GWAS. And in, in this study, we used a blood trait GWAS, so all kinds of uh, white blood cell counts and um, platelet shape and those types of things that are among the most powerful GWASs that there are. And, and also one benefit is that the, the K562 cells that are very easy to manipulate and grow, et cetera, it is, it is a blood trait cell line that is uh, kind of like a relevant cell line for, for many of these very powerful GWASs. So, so basically starting from these blood trait GWASs, we first find map the likely causal variants and then intersected those with regulatory elements or putative regulatory elements annotated by ENCODE, so a taxi and, and other, other kind of marks that, that implicate that these variants might be enhancers. And then those loci we uh, target with CRISPR I guide RNAs to, to silence those uh, regulatory uh, loci with, with uh, modified uh, CAS uh, protein. And doing this, this analysis in a multiplex type of a way where each cell gets about different, 10 different uh, gRNAs to silence 10 different um, uh, uh, enhancers. And then um, doing the readout in a multimodal single cell capture way where we can have a readout of the guide RNA, the transcriptome, and also surface, surface proteins. I'm not going to talk about the protein part now. This allows us to do this analysis really at, at very large scale for, for a quite a reasonable price. And then um, having these, these uh, cells with uh, different perturbations of, of different uh, enhancers and single cell transcriptomes allows us to then test for each gRNA if it affects the expression of, of uh, given genes. So that we take all the gel cells that have the, uh, uh, the that given guide RNA and then all the cells that don't. And then we basically do uh, differential expression analysis between uh, those uh, um, um, with a test that is specific specifically designed for these types of uh, single cell perturbation uh, data. So this is an example of kind of what the data looks like altogether. So this is, I'm, I'm describing uh, data from that is that is described in the preprint and that is kind of like the phase one of, of StingSeq. We actually have now done something like four times this, this many loci, but to start with, um, we uh, targeted uh, 56 uh, GWAS loci with 88 variants and then tested about 600 nearby genes for, for uh, association with the gRNA. Uh, the, with the enhancer uh, silencing. So, so this is an example locus here where we have um, a blood trait GWAS uh, signal here and the kind of the purple variant, uh, kind of like there is a cluster of SNPs that are the fine mapped uh, SNPs for these putative causal variants. And there is, as, as usual for GWAS, there is a bunch of different genes here uh, nearby. One of these variants overlaps a putative uh, enhancer marked by, by open chromatin and, and some histone marks. And that enhancer we targeted with gRNAs to, to silence its activity. And here on the left-hand side, you can see what the data looks like. So here, um, each kind of faint small gray dot is a cell. And, and it shows the gene expression levels for these different nearby genes for all cells. And then for, for non-targeting kind of negative control um, uh, cells. And then for um, the cells that have, have the gRNA for this uh, specific uh, enhancer locus. And we see that specifically for CD52 gene, the, the, the expression of this gene is, is significantly depleted uh, for, for uh, the cells that have this gRNA. So this is basically pretty strong evidence that, that this, this enhancer and this, this fine mapped uh, GWAS SNP here is affecting the expression of CD52. This is actually not the nearest gene of this, this locus. Um, it is, it is the kind of next, next uh, uh, one. 
So altogether for these 88 um, uh, candidates, this regulatory uh, low, low site, uh, we found a significant uh, gene in CIS for 42%, for so 37, which I think is a very high yield. I was super excited to, to see this, that this, this actually works, works quite well and kind of significant discoveries are not the kind of like a little bit of handful discoveries here and there, but it, it really works, works quite well and has a good sensitivity. Interestingly, only a handful of these associations are seen in eQTL data, which is something that we're looking into. And um, yeah, overall, we can see that that I mean the data is, is of extremely clean and good quality. Typically, the the uh, gene that is affected is the closest gene in about seventy percent of the cases, but in about thirty percent, it is something else. This is consistent with other other studies, and typically we see one uh, gene affected in cis, but sometimes we see multiple multiple genes affected by the same enhancer, and sometimes we have low side where a single gene is affected by multiple independent uh, cis regulatory uh, uh, effects and, and independent. And gRNAs. But one of the exciting things is that we can do much more with this data than just kind of like catalog these cis regulatory affected genes and describe their architecture. We can also see in some, some situations that when you have a cis regulatory effect on a transcription factor, this can lead to widespread trans regulatory effects across the gene. And a particularly interesting locus is, is um, the GFI1B transcription factor locus, where we have two independent GWAS signals in two independent enhancers. One of them is, is in an intron of GFI1B, and one of them is, is downstream uh, from, the, from the gene. And so we can see that both of these, both of these enhancers affect the expression of GFI1B. Uh, the downstream enhancer is a little bit stronger effect. And, and then for, for both of these, and actually also for a, a third locus that I'm not going to talk about, but for both of these enhancers, we see that um, these gRNAs for these GWAS loci is associated to expression of hundreds of genes across the genome. And, and um, the interesting thing is that, that these, these genes, like they're not just sort of like a random, random set of genes. We actually see that when we take, take all of these, these uh, target genes in, in trans and then analyze um, their overlap with, with, um, um, with um, genes implicated by GWAS for these blood, blood traits, we can see that there's a significant enrichment. So basically, um, the, the target genes of these GFI1B GWAS enhancers are enriched for GWAS associations for red blood cell traits, white blood cells, and, and platelet traits, especially the red blood cell and platelet traits. And what this is suggesting is that this GFI1B pathway that our analysis uh, implicates that has not been described before in, in detail. We don't, we, we don't have a detailed information about uh, what are the genes affected by GFI1B perturbation. But so this, this set of gene is, is in, in rich for GWAS is in, implicating that, that, that this pathway is, is something where kind of basically multiple independent genetic variants kind of hitting different components of this gene contribute to this blood trait GWAS is that there is this kind of polygenic dysregulation of the pathway way that is, that is uh, part of the sort of architecture of GWAS signals here. And, and this, is, this is quite uh, sort of exciting in terms of being able to characterize not just those kind of cis target genes, but also the pathways that are actually impacted. And we can also uh, characterize these pathways and their kind of putative more detailed molecular mechanisms in, in, in some more detail using, using our data. So if we take all of these, um, these trans target genes and we look at their co-expression patterns, we can see that they cluster in a couple of different modules where uh, the, the cluster A, like a very, very tight, tight sort of set of genes, seem to represent um, or, or they are enriched for direct targets of GFI1B. They're enriched for TF binding sites for, for this transcription factor. And then um, the cluster C is particularly interesting because it has a strong um, gene ontology enrichment for heme biosynthesis uh, terms. It is expressed in specific um, sort of progenitor cell types. And the overall GWAS enrichment uh, in red blood cells and platelet traits seems to be driven specifically by this, this cluster. So we think that there is sort of like a specific effect here where, where um, um, this is a set of genes that, who's, uh, who's kind of like the disruption of, of this part of the pathway affects certain blood, blood progenitor traits in a, in a way that then changes the heme biosynthesis pathways. 
So to, to summarize um, um, the Stingsig uh, study, we basically have an approach here to discover GWAS target genes with high scalability and sensitivity that, that can have very uh, interesting applications for, for multiple GWASs. And it provides highly orthogonal data to EQTL mapping and co-localization analysis that I described before, which I think is, is, is exciting and sort of figuring out when and how these things overlap and when what, what type of sort of complementary information these different approaches provide, I think is an interesting and exciting uh, avenue for the, for the field. Uh, we described some of the interesting regulatory architecture when it comes to cis regulatory targets, and then also these trans regulatory signals that are highly informative of the impacted pathways and the biology there. When we find them, we do have out of the 37 loci where we have a significant uh, cis target gene, uh, we find uh, strong trans signals only for three of them. So, so many of these genes seem to put putatively affect traits via some other mechanisms that then, then large scale. Uh, disruptions of, of the uh, regulatory um, sort of uh, network landscape. Uh, some of the future challenges here uh, is that uh, improved and kind of good quality fine mapping of GWAS loci is very important for functional follow-up. And this is something that, that GWAS people sometimes kind of ignore a little bit that they're like, yeah, fine mapping is a nice little analysis that one can do if you feel like it. But, but like if you're thinking about actually starting to design guides and do single slur and they seek, et cetera, this, is, this stuff is, is not exactly sort of things think is pretty cheap, but it's not free. And being able to kind of target uh, really like strongly, strongly implicated causal low size is very important. Um, one, one important sort of challenge for, for all of these uh, studies that use cellular models is that um, you really need to have a relevant cell type that you can manipulate and grow in vitro and, and kind of transduce with gRNAs, etc. And for many different GWAS laws, uh, we first of all don't know what is the relevant cell type and there is no good cellular model to, to, to uh, use in, in these types of approaches. And this is something that the field really needs to kind of uh, step up in. Um, but yeah, I think I'll, I'll sort of like wrap up there and just just sort of like say that, um, sorry, I, yeah, sorry, I messed up my <laughs> summary slides. So so these are very exciting time, times for functional genetics overall. So I've sort of described how, how studies like GTEx and others have built this very solid foundation for molecular analysis of large human cohorts. And for example, in TopMed, we are doing interesting work where we are looking at not just sort of like multi-omic um, data and the genome, but we also have data of environmental exposures, different physiology, different disease phenotypes, and describing how these things sort of um, interact and, and have interesting causal relationships with each other is, uh, is an interesting challenge for the, for the field with a lot of opportunity. And then integrating these, these insights with large scale perturbation experiments is, is, is I think, a, just a super exciting um, area of, of research where uh, these different types of sort of natural occurring genetic variation and CRISPR induced genomic perturbations provide us with very kind of orthogonal insights into some of the shared uh, biology of causal mechanisms and, and disease processes and, and hopefully ultimately um, enable us to move uh, more towards sort of molecular precision medicine that, that it provides not just better diagnosis but also better understanding of mechanisms and, and, and drug target uh, discovery, etc. One of the kind of um, um, venues that is that is pushing um, these types of um, uh, approaches forward is the International Common Disease Alliance. It's a relatively new um, sort of effort that is maybe something a little bit like Human Cell Atlas, but for complex disease genetics. That is that is uh, building uh, genetic maps for for different uh, diseases and traits. I co-chair the mechanisms working group to learn the cells, tissues, pathways, and networks for for complex disease loci. And then there is also a subgroup for medicine to really kind of push these, these uh, efforts forward into, into medical um, applications. So, so ICDA is an interesting, interesting kind of um, um, effort that is, that is just uh, still quite new and getting started. So keep an eye on that. And with that, I'll acknowledge many people in, in my lab. So, so there's a bunch of people in, in New York, um, a small but growing group of people in, in Stockholm. Uh, many thanks to Daphne, uh, Sarah, and, and other alumni in the, in the lab. Francois Agué has been a long 
long-term collaborator in, in many uh, projects and, and uh, led the GTEx uh, work. And also thanks, thanks to other collaborators, funders, uh, you for listening. And I'll also uh, uh, finish by, by mentioning that I am recruiting postdocs, especially to the Stockholm lab, but also to the New York lab. So, so if you're interested or, or know people, uh, please uh, get in touch or spread the word. Thanks very much. And I'm happy to take your questions. Thanks, Tuli, for this amazing talk. So if anyone wants to ask questions, maybe you can unmute yourself. Ah, or um, there are questions in the chat, okay, for, from Samir. What should be the sequencing depth for identifying variants from transcriptome data? Yeah, so I guess this refers to like actually doing sort of genotype calling from RNA-seq data so that um, yeah, if you don't have, let's say, whole genome sequencing data, you try to describe your, your variants from RNA-seq data. I think it varies. And one of the challenges here is that, um, like, like, let's say that you can, like, something like whole genome sequencing data, you can say, that, okay, we have a 30x genome, and it doesn't mean that you have exactly 30 reads over every single lo locus, but it's something like, kind of, I don't know, between 20 and 40, and it's pretty even. But uh, for transcriptome data, the coverage that you have for each gene is basically driven not just by your overall number of reads, but by the expression level of that gene. So you have some genes that have like thousands and thousands of reads and just like a ton of data, and you would be able to identify all kinds of variants in those genes extremely well. But then for lowly expressed genes, you have very few reads. And even if you sequence more reads, they, they're still going to be kind of lowly covered. So I don't think there is sort of like a single answer for, for that to one. Uh, yeah, it's, it's always going to be a little bit sort of, uh, you won't be able to call all the, all the variants from transcriptome data, no matter what your sequencing depth is. Cool, Amelie? Yeah, so I uh, hi, yes, thank you, Chili, for this uh, great uh, talk. Uh, I had a question regarding StingSeq and wondering how you can or you have evaluated um, off-target perturbations and whether, you know, is that confounded with the trans, trans effects that you're, uh, or some of them that you're detecting? Yeah, yeah. So, so for the for the cis effects, um, we don't really care about, or like we don't worry about off targets because, like, yeah, if we see a significant effect for a nearby gene, it's like it's it would be very unlikely if it was driven by some off target effects elsewhere in the genome. But for the trans loci, as, as you as you mentioned, it is it is something that we need to take into account that if it was some sort of like a gRNA that just goes goes wrong in the genome. But so so we validate these with a couple of approaches. So first of all. Well, for each locus, we design two, two uh, gRNAs that are nearby each other, and we we kind of like want to see that the trans effect is, is consistent between, between the two of them. Um, then we also can do basically sort of biological validation. So for example, uh, for the GFI1B, well, that is, that is a locus where we actually have two like independent enhancers showing a very highly correlated trans signal. So, so that's, that's sort of excellent validation that this is, this is not an off-target effects or otherwise it would need to be off-target effects by like four gRNAs in two enhancers. Yes. And then for example, for the, for the other locus that I didn't talk about, NFE2, that is also a transcription factor. And also for GF5-1B, we can analyze with uh, ChIP-seq data when we have that for the transcription factor to show that there is an enrichment of of um, um, basically TF peaks for that transcription factor close to the trans target genes. And, and that like otherwise it sort of makes, makes biological uh, sense. Hmm. But it's certainly something to kind of like be a little bit, a little bit careful about. But, yeah. Francisco? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for this uh, speech. It was very interesting. Um, I have a question. When we identify a locus in a, from a GWAS study, from a summary statistics uh, of a GWAS study, uh, we have a lot of variants that are uh, variants that are in linkage disequilibrium. So should we uh, to test each variant for, uh, for EQTL, for example, or there is a filtration step, previous filtration step with, to identify the most causal variants or this is my question, yeah. according to you. Yeah, so in EQTL mapping, similarly to GWAS mapping, it 
after a little bit of sort of uh, wobbling around in the community, kind of like whatever, 15 years ago or something, it has become quite solidly established that it is it is best to basically test each variant uh, independently, separately, and then post hoc, one can sort of do fine mapping or analysis of like what's the only pattern here and what's the association signal and and kind of if you have a bunch of variants in strong LD and your, your kind of uh, resulting signal is just like a big LD block or some strong associations, you deal with that post hoc. Because if you try to start to do some sort of LD pruning of removing variants in strong LD kind of before, and it becomes like a question is where do you set the threshold and it becomes like a bigger mess than, than just kind of testing each variant independently and then account for LD in, in subsequent analysis. Okay, thank you very much. I don't see any other questions, so I, I'll ask one myself. So you mentioned that there is a lot of sharing between EQTLs and, and tissues that we've seen this in the GTEx and so on. And then you said that maybe, you know, there are, you know, cell types, cell types are shared across tissues, that maybe that was it. But I wanted to know if you think this, this is the case when we go to cell type, Resolution, or maybe is that the, a lot of these equities are just shared, no matter the cell type. And I know the data is just coming now, but I'm curious yeah. about what feeling. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. Something something that I have been thinking about quite a bit because it's of course kind of typically. Let's say you have put quite a bit of money to doing like a single cell EQTL study, of course, you're going to kind of highlight the novel and discoveries that are different from, from what was previously described. And, and like people tend to describe always the kind of like, oh, see, this is um, a cell state specific effect that we see here. And kind of like sort of sweep a little bit under the carpet, the fact that a lot of these, these variants are, are like seem to just have like very shared effects. So I, I think we don't fully know, like it's of course, like it's a distribution, um, but I, I think it is not so that that really kind of like everything is super cell type specific. And, and this is just kind of like the persistent pattern for, for all of this. I think there is, there is really quite a lot of, of sharing of, of uh, genetic effects across, across different cell types. There is of course, kind of like the fact that, I mean, gene expression is also kind of, it, it, it's it's sometimes cell type specific. So it's like if your gene is only expressed expressed in a given one tissue or cell type, then then it's kind of like by default kind of like a cell type specific genetic effect because other, otherwise there is there's nothing. Right. Uh, but yeah, I think it's it's a it's an interesting interesting question that I think the fields really needs to kind of like work to to properly describe describe what's the what's the landscape. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. And then another question, maybe more technical, but why did you do DNA sequencing for the own project and not RNA? Uh, for which project, sorry? Why did you Why did you do cDNA sequencing for the? Yeah, uh, uh, practicalities. So, so you can sequence direct RNA with ONT technology. Um, I think there is like still like it's just like a handful of papers because it's so hard. You That's need it. like bucket loads of RNA to begin with. Like yeah. you need a lot of material. And, and if you're talking about something like GTEx tissue samples, like these are finite samples and quite precious samples. So we cannot, cannot just get like tons of tons of RNA. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just like, it's technically difficult and the yield is very low. And the same, so so we use the cDNA PCR protocol. We also benchmarked it. There is in the paper a few samples with like the direct cDNA protocol without PCR that gives you slightly longer reads. Um, and it, it is probably better if you want to do like, let's say novel transcript annotation. But again, for that, like without the PCR step, the number of reads that you get is low and the input material requirements are higher. So if you want to do quantification, which is something that we want to do, or a little specific analysis, you need to have those read counts. Otherwise it's like, it's not enough to have like a nice one long read that will like might describe and kind of annotate some transcript really nicely. But if you can't really kind of quantify and compare different samples, et cetera. Uh, so it's it's a matter of like what's what's the ultimate goal, what's the what's the best um, approach uh, there. Cool, thanks, Ida. 
Yeah, hi. Uh, I see another question in the chat. Well, I have one question, but maybe the, the one in the chat. Later, yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah. okay, great. Okay, great, Tuli. How uh, is Laura Fashel talking? And how well long read RNA seq performs for genes at the HLA region? Um, we haven't looked specifically. I would expect it to perform quite well and actually provide uh, quite a bit of additional information in terms of like a proper phasing of, of the of the variants. That is like since this is such a highly variable region and there is with short reads you have mapping issues and those kinds of things, but with long reads the mapping issues are, are less, even though there are sequencing errors, but but that like you can you can align better. So I, I think that there is probably quite a bit of uh, gains to be made there. I was actually thinking about it the other week that we should probably like look into the HLA region, but we don't we don't really have an immunologist in the lab anymore after Sarah Kim Helmuth uh, left and started her own lab in, in Munich. So so I don't really understand much about the HLA. So I've always been kind of a little bit sort of wary about it. The locus is such a mess, like such an important locus, but it's a mess. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so um, thanks, Dr. Tulia. So uh, I have a question on the on the same line that Marta asked a bit, I think, and it's about the well, the your study about CZQTLs and SQTLs um, interaction with cell types, the GTEx one, where you deconvoluted the the data and then you can find these interactions. So I was thinking if it would be, I mean, I don't know if it would be meaningful, but I think that um, something similar could be. Uh, I don't know if you have done like something similar with the allelic specific transcript structure at the cell type level. So trying to to see this yeah. kind of effect that may vary between cell types, you know, like something similar to the CZQTL. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, no, that's an interesting question. We haven't done it Mm. yet um we would be interested in doing that the problem is that to be able to do that kind of deconvolution or, or, or kind of like basically um like pull apart the different cell type effects mm. you need either data from the specific cell types like like really sort of extract specific cells and then do do long read sequencing of those or you need to have in a population sample if you have bulk data you need to have enough of individuals and variation in the cell type composition between them so that you can use that variation to pull apart the effects and basically see if, 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 yeah yeah exactly um, so that, that, and, and that, we, that we don't have so we don't have enough samples of from a given tissue with ONT data to be able to kind of like statistically pull apart um, the different different uh, cell types but okay. um, yeah. So I, I wasn't aware of, of that limitation. Maybe I, I didn't recall the number of donors mm -hmm. you have with long read <laughs> data. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, I, I guess, I mean, one one could kind of like just sort of do deconvolution, but then to be able to kind of say that, okay, this transcript I believe is coming from this cell type. The deconvolution doesn't really give you that um, unless you have already done the kind of cell type specific analysis. Okay. Yeah. People are people are ha, have developed various ways of doing ONT in 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 single cells. It's a little tricky because of reasons, <laughs> many reasons, but it's 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 possible. Okay, thanks. Cool. So there's one more question in the chat. Is there a downside to using cDNA? Madison Snyder is asking. Yeah, yeah. So of course, like if, if one was doing direct RNA seq, then you could look at sort of RNA modifications. Uh, cDNA, just the, the reverse transcription, it has its biases. So that that kind of like yeah, it's not it's not anymore the the, the molecule that you wanted to look at, and then and, and, and yeah, the, the the reverse transcription has. It has some effects and also one of the things from the reverse transcription and and then also poly a enrichment and those kinds of steps is that is that there is always like with every step there is a risk of fragmenting your your molecule um so so what we get in our pcr cdna protocol is typically reads that are about thousand base pairs long these are not always full transcripts they are long reads but not always full transcripts and that we need to take into account in the in the analysis and kind of how we treat the data and how we use it. Um, versus like with the non-PCR cDNA, 
you get slightly longer reads and with RNA, the direct RNA, you can, like you, you get longer reads, there just may be like very few of them. Okay, this was great. Uh, I think we're on time. Unless anyone else has a quick question, uh, we can end here. I would thank Tuli again for the talk and uh, yes, and for being here virtually next time to be in person. <laughs> yeah, so thanks a lot, Tuli. Thanks everyone. This was, this was fun. <laughs>